SLT Fiber and experience the power of fiber technology. Sri Lanka's only super fast internet connection. SLT Fiber. Call 1212 now. Tonight, Budget 2020 postponed. The Cabinet approves vote and account. No positive signs. Catholic bishops lean on the government for a fresh Easter attack probe. 55 already dead. Dengue caught slipping under the radar. Normally we have dengue virus type 1 and type 4 in Sri Lanka. This year we found predominantly type 3. Just our luck. Ocular bags of Pfeiffer before rain halts play against New Zealand. All that and much more coming up on First at Nine this Wednesday, the 14th of August, 2019. Now life boy, cool fresh, saha lemon fresh, menthol saha lemon saare. Daha diya tanda ethi karna sangu wun visa beecha vali arak shakra obava fresh karai. Visa beecha off, fresh shaka on. From Adha Verana, this is Adha Verana First at Nine. Live from Studio 24 in Colombo. Good evening and welcome to First at Nine. I'm Dhamma Kekanayka. Let's start with your local stories. The Catholic Bishops Conference in Sri Lanka urges the government to conduct an impartial inquiry into the Easter Sunday attacks as a matter of utmost urgency. Issuing a statement signed by 14 bishops, the CBCSL expressed disappointment over the Presidential Commission report not seeing the light of day. The Catholic Bishops' Conference in Sri Lanka issued a statement expressing grief over the lack of a fair and impartial investigation into the Easter Sunday attacks, which resulted in the deaths of more than 250 people and loss of limbs of several hundreds. The CBCSL insists that even though several committees have been established with the objective of finding out those responsible for the serious lapses in security, as a matter of justice, the final aim of the inquiries should be to ascertain the perpetrators while observing that there aren't any positive signs in this regard. The bishops also expressed disappointment over the report of the three-member presidential commission not seeing the light of the day yet, while pointing out that the government is yet to give assurance to the people that the law implies to every citizen of this country. The statement therefore urged the government to ensure an independent and impartial inquiry as a matter of utmost urgency. While appreciating various relief efforts of the government, the statement notes that doing justice is of utmost importance. It highlights that this process should be conducted impartially and irrespective of ethnicity, religion or any other factor. The statement has been signed by 14 bishops of the country. Now, during the cabinet meeting held yesterday, the cabinet of ministers decided to postpone the budget for 2020 and prepare a vote on account in the meantime. There, was, uh, there were several other notable decisions made as well. During the meeting held between Cabinet of Ministers yesterday, they agreed to postpone the budget for next year and prepare a vote on account for the first four months of 2020. The proposal was presented by Minister of Finance Mangala Samaravira and it will now be presented to Parliament for approval. The Cabinet had also approved the proposal to rescind the Finance Bill prepared for revising the Finance Act No. 35 of 2018 to amend the definition of term motor vehicle and to impose 3.5% foreign trade tax on payments made outside Sri Lanka. Member of Parliament Tilanga Sumatipala has presented a private member's bill for incorporation of Ceylon Psychological Association. The Cabinet of Ministers had given the green light for the proposal to present the mooted bill, prepared by the legal draftsman to the Parliament and to gazette it in all three languages. Now, Prime Minister Ranil Vikramasinghe aims to tie up the economy and politics in one policy intending to benefit from Sri Lanka's geographical location while bringing in new laws through offshore centres, calling it the master plan towards making Sri Lanka or making the island nation rather have the Indian Ocean. Speaking at an event in Colombo yesterday, the Premier also touched on the freedom of navigation in the Indian Ocean, emphasising that it is limited to economical, cultural and political cooperation, but not military cooperation. 
the economic potential of the Indian Ocean certainly is great. We had to broaden the Indian agreement. We had the FTA with Singapore. We have the potential of working out with many of the Bay of Bengal countries. We had to move by ourselves within the Indian Ocean region because still there wasn't sufficient uh, agreement within the region. If we get these agreements in addition to our arrangements with China, with the European Union, that certainly places us in a good position to be a base for competitive value addition. So with this, the economics and the politics were tied up into one policy of how we benefit from our location. Then bring in the new laws through the offshore centers. This, this certainly is the master plan of how we are going to lay the foundation to become the hub of the Indian Ocean. We are finding tensions coming in and who was in a position to talk to everyone and bring them out to discuss the freedom of navigation and digital connectivity in the Indian Ocean. Your digital connectivity today is as important as the freedom of navigation. It's an area in which Sri Lanka should specialize. So we have now made the Indian Ocean our key strategy. Freedom of navigation in the Indian Ocean means no military alliance with anyone, but economic, cultural and political cooperation with everyone. We have also got to be mindful of the mutual security interests of India and Sri Lanka. Based on this, finally Sri Lanka will also look at its own defense strategy and security strategy where we will have to focus more on a role we play in a smaller section of the Indian Ocean in looking at the sea lanes and the security role that we are going to play. We have to be one of the key countries looking at the blue economy of the Indian Ocean. We are surrounded by this ocean. Why aren't we making the best use of it? Newly declared presidential candidate of the Sri Lanka, Podujana Peramuna, former Defence Secretary Gautabi Rajpaksha, paid homage to the Temple of the Sacred Tooth Relic in Kandy this morning. He also called on Chief Prelates of the Malvatta and Asgiriya chapters, as well as the Chief Prelate of the Ramanya sect, as he visited various religious sites. Presidential candidate of the Sri Lanka Podujana Peramuna, former Defence Secretary Gautabi Rajapaksa, paid homage to the Temple of the Sacred Tooth Relic in Kandy this morning. He was joined by opposition leader Mahinda Rajapaksa and national organizer of SLPP Basil Rajapaksa. Arriving at the Malvatta Temple, the former Defence Secretary met with Chief Prelate of the Malvatta Chapter, Most Venerable Tibatuave Sri Sumangala Thera. He also called on Anunayaka of the Malvatta Chapter, Most Venerable Dimbul Kumburevi Maladhamma Thera. The former Defence Secretary then met with Chief Prelate of the Asgiriya Chapter, Most Venerable Varakagoda Sri Nyana Ratanathera. <laughs> SLPP's presidential candidate Gotabe Rajapaksa and opposition leader Mahinda Rajapaksa then visited the Pillayar Kovil in Kandy along with parliamentarians backing the SLPP. We are fully mindful of enhancing the state of income of plantation sector workers, employment issues of the youth and the housing problem. Under a government of ours, we will definitely take measures to address these concerns. Gotabe Rajapaksa, accompanied by the leader of the opposition, then arrived at the Miramaka Mosque in Kandy. Minister of Housing and Construction Sajid Premadas is unfazed by the identities of his political opponents, hinting that the looming presidential election will be won on policies and vision. The minister also dismissed the criticism levelled against him by Field Marshal Sarat Fonseca yesterday as he spoke after a party leaders' meeting of the United National Front. 
A discussion with the participation of party leaders of the United National Front was held at the Temple Trees last evening. It was chaired by Prime Minister Ranil Vikramasinghe. We discussed the strategies which will help gather all organizations at grassroots level, including village level, to move forward in the political journey. There is freedom of expression in this country and democratically anyone can hold a stance. Future of our political journey is decided by our policies, vision and initiatives. The identities of our opponents are not a relevant factor here. Election monitoring body, the People's Action for Free and Fair Election, points out that working off provincial council elections is a simple enough task if the government has the political will to do so. Executive Director of PAFRA, Rohan Ahetyarachi, made the remark during a media briefing in Colombo today, adding that a mechanism might have to be in place, considering the fact, or in fact to consider the second and third preferences, as he expects, expects votes to be split, leading to a tighter presidential race. If the government makes a political decision to hold the provincial council election, it can be done by making a very small amendment to the Act. Our stance is that if the provincial council election is to be held, it must be done closer to the presidential election. The Election Commission says that it will save about 2 billion rupees if these two elections are held closer to each other. We must pay close attention to the fact that whether a candidate will be able to secure 50.1 percent during the upcoming presidential election. It was only during two occasions from the period of 1982 to 2015 that candidates were able to secure a clear majority. That was in 1994 and 2010 when candidates secured 57 percent and 62 percent respectively. In all other presidential elections, the winning candidate could only secure between 50 percent to 52 percent. Nineteen candidates contested in the 2015 presidential election. Seventeen of them together were only able to secure 130,000 votes for themselves themselves and they weren't able to make an impact on the mainstream election result. However, in the current situation, there does seem to be several other potential candidates other than the two mainstream presidential candidates who could make that impact. And if all those candidates come together to secure more than 500,000 votes, the Election Commission will have to count in second and third preferential votes as well. Army Commander Lieutenant General Mahesh Senanayake emphasizes that all necessary security measures have been ensured ahead of the annual chariot festival of the Nallur Kandaswami Temple in Jaffna. The Army Commander expressed these views during an inspection tour at the site. Army Commander Lieutenant General Mahesh Senanayake inspected the security measures at the Nallur Kandaswami Temple in Jaffna today ahead of the annual chariot festival or Tir Tirvela festival of the temple. Unfortunately, it was because of the attacks of the 21st of April that we had to deploy a certain number of military personnel for security here. We're trying to prevent further incidents. We can't say that the threat of terror has subdued as there could be what we term lone wolf attacks. We're trying to protect you from such attacks as well. It is the army and the police which know about this subject and we know our job. This Hindu temple wouldn't be here for 300 years if we did not know how to do our job. We are blessed by deities. Those who claim such things might not have the blessings and might not have in the future as well. High Commission of Pakistan retired Major General Dr. Shahid Ahmed Hazmat has met with opposition leader Mahindra Rajpaksha recently and briefed him about the latest situation in Jammu and Kashmir. 
A statement published by the Pakistan High Commission in Colombo said the High Commissioner praised the opposition leader that unilateral action taken by India to scrap the special status of Jammu and Kashmir by revoking the Article 370 were gross violation of international law. He emphasized that Pakistan is strongly opposed to any move that would seek to alter the demographic structure of Jammu and Kashmir as it is, as it is an internationally recognized disputed territory. He also stressed that ultimate resolution of the Jammu and Kashmir dispute is to be determined through a uh, publicized by the United Nations in accordance with the numerous resolutions of the Security Council. The High Commissioner underscored the importance of cooperation among some countries to promote peace and harmony in South Asia. More news awaits on the other side of this break. Stay tuned. Welcome back. You're watching First at Nine. Now, dengue is an all too familiar virus which makes headlines during certain times of the year. With Sri Lanka still recovering from the Easter Sunday attacks and the preamble to the presidential election, which is set to be held towards the end of the year in full swing, dengue this year seems to have sneaked under the radar. The reality is that 55 people have already lost their lives to dengue so far this year, prompting health authorities to highlight what they call risk areas, with almost half of this year's dengue cases being reported from the western province. What's more, dengue could well delay blow to the island's efforts to revive the tourism sector, with a British man, a father of two, dying just weeks after suffering a mosquito bite in Sri Lanka. During the past five decades, the incidence of dengue has increased by 30-fold across the world. Some 50 to 100 million new infections are estimated to occur annually in more than 100 endemic countries, with a documented further spread to previously unaffected areas. Every year, hundreds of thousands of severe cases arise, including 20,000 deaths often affected very poor populations. Data of the World Health Organization shows that more than 70% of the disease burdens the Southeast Asia and the Western Pacific. With that being the situation during the past few months, an upturn in the number of dengue cases have been reported in Sri Lanka. The National Dengue Control Unit says they are usually in an increase in cases during the months of June, July and August, owing to the southwest monsoon season prevailing in the island. With the Epidemiology Unit of the Ministry of Health, however, putting the number of confirmed cases at 36,858 so far this year, including 55 confirmed deaths owing to this mosquito-borne disease, Director of the NDCU Dr. Anurajai Sekra attributes several other reasons for the increased cases. Normally, we have dengue virus type 1 and type 4 in Sri Lanka. This year, we found predominantly type 3. Other Causes patient reported late. If you have dengue, you have to seek medical treatment as soon as possible. The pregnant mothers, small children, elders, and the people with other diseases like heart failure, uh, kidney disease, they have to seek medical treatment very early than others. The vector for dengue Aedes mosquito bites during the day and it spreads four distinct serotypes of the dengue virus, DEN1, DEN2, DEN3 and DEN4. The highest biting intensity is around two hours after sunrise and before sunset. An infected Aedes mosquito bites four to five people at a time, which results in multiple dengue cases in the same area. Owing to the southwest monsoon season, the Health Ministry has identified provinces of Western, Southern, Central and Sabaragamua as risk areas for dengue this year. However, health officials raised alarm after dengue cases from the Western province went up to 16,632 by August. So why is it that almost half of the country's dengue cases popping up from the Western province? One reason is this urbanization. Other thing, we can see there are a lot of breeding places in construction sites. So we have given instruction to all the construction sites through MOHS how to prevent mosquito breeding. So other things we can see the lot of houses in these cities, uh, they are partly built. They are only have slabs 
no roofs so water can be collected in these slabs it is very important to spend at least 30 minutes per week to clean your premises dengue is characterized by a high fever of 40 celsius or 104 fahrenheit accompanied by two or more of the symptoms such as severe headache pain behind the eyes muscle and joint pains nausea and vomiting as well as rash on skin it is advised that people experiencing dengue symptoms should rest, consume plenty of fluids and take only paracetamol to bring down the fever. Public are also warned against taking several other types of medicine which could potentially lead to death of a patient. One category is NSAIDs. You uh, may know the names aspirin, mefenamic acid, uh, diclofenac sodium, uh, ibuprofen and also the steroids prednisolone, dexamethasone. These drugs should not be taken for fever these days because if you have dengue, it may cause to severe dengue leads to death. Dengue can be fatal and it does not have a vaccine or cure. So the emphasis is on prevention. The National Dengue Control Unit has been focused on controlling the situation over the past few months but urges the public to be vigilant on their end. By taking simple measures such as keeping your neighbourhoods clean and free of receptacles that attract dengue-carrying mosquitoes, wearing clothes that cover the body and minimise exposure to mosquito bites during crucial hours, as well as by using mosquito repellents and mosquito nets, you will be able to save a life from this potentially deadly virus. Global oil prices jumped yesterday by the most so far this year after the United States said it would delay imposing a 10% tariff on certain Chinese products, easing concerns over a global trade war that has pummeled the market in recent months. The Chinese products include laptops and mobile phones. The tariffs had been scheduled to start next month. Brent futures rose $2.73 uh, $2 to settle at $61.30 a barrel, with U.S. West Texas intermediate crude gained $2.17 to settle at $57.10. That was the biggest daily percentage gain for Brent since December, when the contract gained 7.9%. Germany's economy has contracted during the April to June period of this year. According to official data, a decline in exports pumped uh, dampened growth, which comes amid concerns of a global slowdown. The Federal Statistics Office, office says gross domestic product fell by 0.1% compared with the previous quarter. That makes the annual growth rate down to 0.4%. Germany, Europe's largest economy, narrowly avoided a recession last year. The chief Europe economist at Capital Economics says that early signs for the third quarter looks ominous. He added that while the services sector should continue to hold up better, there are some signs that the slump is spreading to the labour market. We're going to move in for a very short break and when we come back we could take we take a look at what's happening around the world. Welcome back. You're watching First at Nine. Now, Hong Kong's airport resumed operations today, rescheduling hundreds of flights that had been disrupted over the past two days as protesters clashed with riot police in a deepening crisis in the Chinese-controlled city. Ten weeks of increasingly violent clashes between police and pro-democracy protesters angered by a perceived erosion of freedoms have plunged the Asian financial hub into its worst crisis since it, uh, since it reverted from British to Chinese rule in 1997. Check-in counters reopened to queues of hundreds of weary travellers who had waited overnight for their flights. Five people were detained in the last disturbance during the number of, uh, and the number of those who were already arrested uh, spikes to 600. In the meantime, Hong Kong's government and police today 
condemned the violent acts by the protesters at the Hong Kong International Airport. A government spokesman said that some violent protesters besieged and assaulted a traveller and a reporter, as well as obstructed an ambulance crew from taking the traveller to hospital and that a police officer too was attacked when police attended to the incident. The statement went on to say that the government severely condemns the violent acts which are outrageous and have overstepped the bottom line of civilised society. British Prime Minister Boris Johnson has accused MPs who think they can block Brexit of a terrible collaboration with the European Union. The PM said that the EU had become less willing to compromise on a new deal with the UK because of the opposition to leaving in Parliament. He said this increased the likelihood of the UK being forced to leave with a no deal in October. The EU has said the agreement struck by Theresa May is the only deal possible. Johnson added that he wanted to leave with a deal but needs EU to compromise. He went on to say that there's a terrible kind of collaboration, as it were, going on between people who think they can block Brexit in Parliament and Britain's European friends. Now, the remains of a giant penguin the size of a human have been discovered in New Zealand. The fossilised bones are of an animal thought to have been about 5 foot 3 inches tall, weighing up to 80 kilograms. It lived in the Pleistocene Epoch between 66 and 56 million years ago. The animal dubbed Monster Penguin by Canterbury Museum adds to the list of now extinct gigantic New Zealand birds, including the flightless moa, which was up to 3.6 metres tall, and Hart's eagle, which had a wingspan of 3 metres. Time for sports and day one of the first test between Sri Lanka and New Zealand was played at the Gaul International Cricket Stadium today. Electing to bat first, New Zealand were 203 for the loss of five wickets, having recovered from 71 for three at lunch when rain stopped play for the day, with Ross Taylor batting on 86. Earlier in the day, the Black Caps built a 64 run opening partnership before Akila Dhananjaya made the breakthrough, removing Latham, or Tom Latham, that is, for 30 runs. Akila was the star of the day as he bagged all five wickets to have fallen on the day. The two-test series, with the second match set to be played in Colombo, is the first for both teams in the newly launched World Test Championship, which features the top nine test-playing nations competing in a league across two years. And that's it from all of us here at First at Nine. Thanks for watching. Bye-bye.